Hi, my name is Josh Satterfield, and I have the honor of being the lead pastor at First at Firewheel Church. Thank you so much for checking out our YouTube channel. I hope the content you watch on this channel encourages you in your walk to or your walk with Jesus as we seek to worship God, love people, and make disciples. If you want to stay up to date with our latest sermons and live stream events, please make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel by hitting the bell notification. And for more information, you can always check out our website, firewheel.com. And if you live in the greater DFW area, we would love to see you at one of our in-person services Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Who's excited to be in the house of God this morning? Come on. Woo! You can be seated. I know that that's one of those awkward moments. It's like, do we stay standing? Do we go, do we get seated? Whatever. Uh, good morning, First at Firewheel. It is an honor Come on, thank you. Talk back to me. Uh, it is an honor to be here with you. I think I was here with you two years ago, I believe, and uh, it was incredible. But I am expecting some really awesome things. I just want to um, really quick give honor where honor is due to Pastor Josh and uh, Pastor Summer and just the, uh, the Satterfield family. I want to say thank you for leading so well. I want to say thank you for navigating so well, right? There's a book called Canoeing the Mountains, and it's it's about how Lewis and Clark, it wasn't a straight path, but guess what? Pastoring, uh, man, you're, you're canoeing the mountains, right? Sometimes you're canoeing upstream. Sometimes you're having to go up, down, and around. It's not always an easy path, uh, not because of the people, all right, but just because of the situations, you know what I'm saying, uh, but I just want to give honor, thank you for, um, man, for being pastors, right, man, so many times people get into this pastor seat, and they try to be influencers, and I want to say thank you for not trying to be influencers, you are influencing, but you get what I'm saying, but thank you for being pastors that love your flock, love your people. Can you give it up for your pastors this morning? Thank you. Woo! Come on, man. That's a, woo! Ah! Uh, that was just pumped me up. I, uh, man, I'm, I'm honored to be here. If you don't know me, uh, me and my wife, uh, we're, we're Jackson and Christina. We are the Youth Alive missionaries of North Texas. And you might be like, what is that? Uh, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of what it is. Man, we are missionaries to the local high schools and middle schools of North Texas. How many of you know that our schools need Jesus? And I just want to say, uh, where's, where's Dr. Dr. Hood? Dr. Hood. Where, hey, I just want to say thank you for being a doctor, right, in the, in the educational space that is a believer in Jesus. And I believe, like, and I say this every time because it would be easy for me to get up here and be like, man, all the schools are, are, are terrible and they're going to hell and we're going to save them. And we are, but I also always say this, it's not just what we're doing, but God is raising up teachers, faculty, and administrators that are godly that are saying, no, we're going to shift this thing and we're going to turn it around. Yes? Come on, can I get an amen? So I just want to say thank you that God honors what you're doing and he sees what you're doing. What we do is we go into public high schools and middle schools and we do two big things. We train youth pastors on how to go from attractional youth ministry to missional youth ministry. And we train students and equip students to go and launch what we call Jesus Clubs in the local high schools and middle schools all across North Texas. How awesome is that? Uh, I got a, just a, I, I'll tell you just a few stories, don't worry, I am preaching today, don't worry, but I, I got to tell you a, a, a few stories about what we are, what we're seeing. Uh, the very first one, you can put that first picture up, um, oh, not that one, uh, uh, or, or maybe a video, maybe it's a video, it might be a video, put a video up, but let me tell you about my, my one of our students named Joseph, okay? And uh, Joseph was a high school student who said, guess what, I want to start a Jesus club in my school. So we helped him start a Jesus club. 
man, uh, it was all the way over in Southwest High School in Fort Worth, Texas. Anybody know where Fort Worth, Texas is? Right? And um, so all that to say, man, he starts at Jesus Club. It starts with three students. We're like, yo, that's cool because you're obedient to God, right? Then it grows to 10. Then it grows to 20. Then it grows to 50. And all through it, right, he says, hey, through my Jesus Club, I want to do a Jesus rally in my school. That's what you're seeing right here in this video that they're playing behind me. So we said, let's do a Jesus rally. And when we did this Jesus rally, guess what? 160 students showed up, and over 50 students said yes to the gospel. And I want you to, and I need you to hear this. They said yes to the gospel, not in a church building, but a school building. Man, let me tell you about a group of middle schoolers kind of up this way near Grapevine, and um, they, started, they, started, um, they started a Jesus Club, and it wasn't um, a huge Jesus Club, still isn't a huge Jesus Club. It's probably 10 to 20 students, but through the course of this school year, so this is this school year, they led seven of their friends to Jesus in their Jesus Club, everybody. But here's the coolest part. And I don't know if we have that baptism picture. I might not have put it in there. If not, it's totally cool. But here's the coolest part is they invited all of those students that gave their lives to Jesus to church Easter Sunday to get baptized in water. So seven of them got baptized in water, but then some of them brought their family members, and a few of their family members gave their lives to Jesus on Easter Sunday. Man, I, I know I don't have a lot of time. I can, can tell you story after story after story, but I know I'm here and I got to preach. <laughs> but, but I will say this, God is using a generation of young people, and, and, and it's not just in the four walls of the church. It is them being used by God in their middle schools, their high schools, their private schools, their charter schools. You know, we even got some homeschool Jesus clubs, everybody. But, but, but God is using gen, a generation that says, I don't care anymore about what people say. I don't care anymore about what people think. But I want to be used by God to reach my friends. And, and, and our, our job at Youth Alive... And the reason why I'm telling you this is because First Ship Fire Will are supporters of Youth Alive. So I want to say thank you for that. But, but what we do is we, Ephesians 4.12, we equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's not just a Pastor Jackson job or a Pastor Noah and Abigail job or a Pastor Josh job. Guess what? We believe 100% that God doesn't just want to use 20, 30, 40, and 50 year olds. He wants to use 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds, right? That's, so I want to say thank you for your generosity towards our ministry. I want to say thank you for supporting what we do at Youth Alive. I want to always give an update to our supporters so that you know that your money, your generosity, your giving is, um, it, it's in good soil. It's in good soil. So I just want to say thank you for that. Can we end this and then I'll get to it, right? Y'all are like, all right, come on. Uh, but can we just end by praying for our schools? praying for teenagers. I believe that some of the greatest next missionaries and pastors and prophets are sitting right here in the seats, but they're 13, 14, 15 years old. So can we pray for that? Can you pray with me? Don't just listen to me pray, but can you pray with me? Is that cool? Come on, let's pray. Father, we pray over the high schools and the middle schools that are over here in this area. God, we pray for Garland ISD. We pray for Wiley ISD. God, we pray for the middle schoolers. God, raise up middle schoolers that say, I want to advance the kingdom. I want to I preach and share the gospel, not just from a stage, but Lord God, one-on-one. -on -one. God, we pray that you would continue to raise up churches and youth ministries in this area. 
that have a heart for the schools, that have a heart for the administrators, a heart for the students, a heart for the faculty. God, I pray, Lord, that we would be missional in our mindset, missional in our heart, missional in our DNA. And God, I pray that you would begin up here in North Dallas, that you would begin to save football teams, that you would begin to save bands, that you would begin to see atheists come to know you. Oh God, I pray that the that the agenda of transgenderism and those things, that God, that we would defeat it with love. We would defeat it with care. We would defeat it with the gospel of Jesus, not the gospel of man. God, break our hearts. I even pray that first at fire will would become a, a church that prays for the schools and prays for the teachers and prays for the faculty. God, break our hearts for the things that break yours. God, open up our hearts to this mission field that maybe we don't even see it as a mission field yet, but God, help us begin to see it as a mission field. We love you and we thank you and we pray all this in your name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Happy Pentecost Sunday, everybody. Woo, the day... The day when the Holy Spirit came on the 120 disciples that were in the upper room. And can I tell you, the death and resurrection changed everything, but the Holy Spirit coming down changed everything as well. That it was the great reversal, am I right? That at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, there was, there was language confusion. But then in Acts 2, there was language unity, right? That, 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 that everything that was a curse, God flipped and then turned it into a blessing. Is anybody grateful for the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> I'm not preaching a... Holy Spirit message per se, but what I am preaching on, you are really going to need the Holy Spirit for. Um, man, I remember when I first was filled with the Holy Spirit. Does anybody remember when they were filled with the Holy Spirit? I remember I was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was two days after I gave my life to Jesus. It was at youth camp. Plug for youth camp. Get your kids signed up. Uh, but but we, um, I, I went to youth camp. Now, you need, you need to understand something about me. I grew up Catholic. We believe in Father, Son, and Holy Mary. Not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I, I, I got invited to church camp. I, I, I wasn't saved even. They invited me to church camp and said, yo, there's going to be, there's going to be girls in games. So I said, bet, let's go. And they were paying my way. This thing was free. So I showed up to youth camp, and they were right. There was girls in games. So I, and I'm being dead serious. And I, I'm telling you, I was not living for Jesus. I went to Catholic Mass every Sunday, but I was not living for Jesus. And I showed up, and uh, my first night, I got wrecked by God, gave my life to Jesus. Let's go. Got saved. So I was like, man, this is awesome. Uh, I don't really know what this means, but cool. Uh, so, man, the second night of youth camp, I don't remember what happened. I guess I wasn't paying attention. So, so then the third day comes, and we're playing games. We're doing all the camp stuff, and everybody's like, yo, tonight's going to be crazy. It's Holy Spirit night. And I was like, what's that? And they were like, it's going to be wild. And I was like, I'm not coming. I was like, I already accepted Jesus. I don't know who this Holy Spirit man is. But they make you come to the services, so I didn't really have an option. So I show up, and again, I don't really remember what this man preached about. I guess it was the Holy Spirit. Uh, but but I remember him making an altar call, and he was like, if you want all God has for you, come down to this altar right now. And I was like, that's me. So I run down to the altar, and as I'm praying, something 
things weird to me started happening. I look over to my right, and people are falling down. It's what we call being slain in the spirit. Hey, I'm all for being slain in the spirit, but at that moment, I walked the other way. I was like, nah, uh that ain't happening, and that guy is not praying for me. <laughs> so I was praying. I was asking God, God, I want all you have for me in this this. This person, I don't even know who he was, literally. It was all a blur. Uh, he, he comes and he puts his hand right here on my head. You know it's serious when somebody puts their hand on their head, right? Y'all know, he's like, boom. I'm like, oh, this is dead serious. And uh, he's praying for me. I'm praying. Guess what? I got filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Let's go, man. Let's go. Amen. And, 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 and that changed my life. But I will say this. I thought, now this is just a funny part of it. I was like, oh, I get it now. In order for this to be real, I have to fall. So guess what I did? Huh? Here goes nothing. Boom. I fell. I was laying on the ground. And I was like, yo, how long are we going to be here? I was like checking. I was like. True story. This is true story. Uh, they, man, that man probably thought he knocked me out. I was like, nah, you didn't. I, f I helped you out. <laughs> I helped you out. Uh, but all that to say, right, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and man, salvation was one thing. But the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying it was better, it was just different. It took my life to another level. Am I right? And I just want to say, here are some truths from Scripture about the Holy Spirit because we all need the Holy Spirit. Every believer needs the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said it is better that he left so the Holy Spirit could come. That's crazy, right? Jesus saves us to be a Christian, but the Holy Spirit empowers us to stay a Christian. Holy Spirit is a helper, a counselor, a comforter, an empower, and a sanctifier. So we all need that in our lives. The Holy Spirit, I always tell this to people, is not weird, controlling, spooky, or abnormal. The Holy Spirit is personal, powerful, and normal. Right? I always say this to people about the Holy Spirit. If we can have enough faith... To believe in a virgin birth, we should have enough faith in the Holy Spirit empowering us. Every believer needs the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is for every believer. And again, like I said, why do we need the Holy Spirit? It's this. This is my last thing. It's to live the life Jesus lived, and so we can do the things Jesus did. And I'm not preaching all, like a Holy Spirit message, so to speak, but I'm telling you what I'm preaching on today, you are going to need the Holy Spirit for. I'm believing today, I've been praying that God today will wake people up from their spiritual slumber. That, 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 that people will be convicted in a new way, that a new hunger in your life would arise and that some of you might be filled for the first time or refilled with the Holy Spirit. Can I say that God is waiting and wanting now more than ever, and the world needs more than ever spirit-filled believers to step onto the scene, not to condemn, not to judge, but to love, to pray, to stand for righteousness, to be his witness, God is waiting and trying to form, and he is forming that kind of church. And so many people today are like, man, we need a loving church. Man, we need a holy church. Man, we need a radical church. And I believe all of that, and I agree with all of that. But before all of that, you want to know what we need? We need an awake church. We, we need a, a, a church that is awake and not falling asleep. Man, that, that, that's what we're talking about today is how have we, have we fallen asleep? 
It's time for us to take an inventory of ourselves, our hearts, our lives, our, our, our spiritual relationship with Jesus and say, have we, follow, have we fa- fallen asleep? The title of my message today is Don't Get Caught Sleeping. Now, the most embarrassing time ever is when you fall asleep when you shouldn't be falling asleep. You know what I'm saying? The, 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 the worst time to fall asleep is during church. And if you tell me you've never fallen asleep in church, two things. You're either a liar or you don't go to church very much. So I don't want to hear it, okay? Like, that ain't true. Uh, but I, I like taking pictures of people when they fall asleep. Now, y'all don't know any of these people I'm about to show, but do we have those pictures? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's put them up there. Look at that. That's my wife. <laughs> She's not here, so I could put that up there. <laughs> come on. All right, come on. That's a student, you student. I love the other student drinking a Yoo-Hoo behind them. <laughs> like, come on. Uh, and then the final one, this is another youth student, right? Or maybe we don't have it. If not, it's okay. It's all right. Hey, you're not ever safe with me, okay? I'm going to get my phone out so if I see anybody falling asleep during my, during my sermon, you're done for. You will be in my next sermon. Uh, <laughs> you will be in my next sermon. So be careful, all right? May, help your neighbor out. Um, but I, I believe this, that the American church has fallen asleep in the worst possible time. Man, in the worst moment, we have fallen asleep. We are not alert when it comes to the things of God, and we are not alert to the enemy's schemes. We have believed this lie a little too well. Y'all ever heard this saying, there's not a demon behind every bush. I, I, people told me that a lot for a long time. And I believe that some of it is true. And what people are saying, like, oh, stop, you're just demon hunting, right? Like, everything's a demon. Car breaks down, it's a demon, right? But the truth of the matter is this, that the devil is not behind bushes anymore. He's in our hands. He's on our screens. He's in our ears. He's in our laws. And, and, and yet the church is still saying there's not a devil behind every bush. And I just want to say this, that Satan is, Satan is not hiding anymore. Satan is not sneaking around, tiptoeing around, trying to like make something. No, no, no. Satan is very, very blatant. His schemes are very forward. His attacks are very visible. And because of that, I just want to say to this church congregation, lukewarm, part-time Christianity will not cut it any longer. It, it, it won't happen. It's not going to win. It will not win the fight. Weak, passive Christianity will no longer change anything or anybody. I'm telling you, this is, this is intense stuff. There's a story about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you don't know who he is, he was a, um, a theologian, a Bible scholar, a pastor and teacher back in the 1940s in, in Germany. And uh, there's a story that when Bonhoeffer's friends began to read copies of his sermons and hear reports about the intensity of the discipleship that he was doing, questions began to arise about him from Christian circles. They, they began to say, was this level of formation truly necessary? Would the Finkenwalders, which is where he was from, would they burn out? Would they lose credibility and be seen as too extreme by the national leadership? Doesn't this sound like a lot of today? That if you get too vocal, if you get too excited about Jesus, oh man, you're too radical, you're too passionate, right? This is what was happening to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But then, this is what happens. It says, one friend in particular, a young historian, 
named Willem Niesel, who had heard Bonhoeffer lecture in 1933, came up from Berlin to visit, being suspicious of too much spiritualism. Bonhoeffer took Niesel on a rowing trip to the Oder Sound. One author described the scene this way. Now, mind you, Bonhoeffer is pastoring during the Nazi regime's uprising. Okay? To give you context of this. In Germany, by the way. Okay? When the two rowers reached the far shore, Bonhoeffer led Niesel up a small hill to a clearing from which they could see in the distance a vast field, listen, and the runways of a nearby squadron. This is the Nazis that they're looking at. German fighter planes were taking off and landing. Soldiers moved hurriedly in purposeful patterns like many ants. Bonhoeffer spoke of a new generation of Germans in training. He's talking about his discipleship training school. Whose disciplines were formed for a kingdom of hardness and cruelty. It would be necessary, he explained, to propose a superior discipline if the Nazis were to be defeated. And this is what he said to his friend as they're looking at the Nazi regime and they're looking at the training and then they're also looking at his discipleship training store. He points at his discipleship training school and he says, this must become stronger than that. This must become stronger than that. Let me tell you what he's saying. The church and the disciples of Christ must become stronger than the training of the Nazis. The people of God must become stronger than the plans of Satan. Commitment must become stronger than the compromise. The truth of scripture must become stronger than song lyrics and movie, movie quotes. Christianity must become stronger than culture and the fear of the Lord must become stronger than the fear of man. And, and I'm telling you today that what was true for Dietrich Bonhoeffer is true for the church in America today. This must become stronger than that. The question is, though, are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for the day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then... Let us not sleep as others do. Let us keep awake and be sober. Now, I know this is about end times, okay? I get that. I understand the context of the scripture. But I think that there's a principle we can still grab from this, and this is what it is. Spiritual slackness, spiritual apathy, and spiritual sleepiness will always put us at a disadvantage against the enemy. It will always put you at a disadvantage. Advantage. And I want you to know the enemy is attacking, he's scheming, he's doing things, and we are either unaware or we are ignoring it. All right, we're going to go to Mark chapter 14. If you have, it'll be on the, it'll be on the Sky Bible. If you have a physical Bible, you can go to uh, Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 14. Um, if you have an iPhone, you can go on your Bible app, app, Mark chapter 14. If you have an Android, just keep it away. Uh, keep that thing in your pocket, please. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Mark chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 37. This is a spiritual warfare moment. Jesus needs his disciples and this is what happens, you've all probably read this, but there's a magnitude of the moment. He returned, it says in verse 37, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Couldn't you stay awake for one hour is what he's saying? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them, everybody say it found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still 
Come on, say it with your chest. Are you still sleeping and resting enough? The hour has come. So what do we see them do? We see them fall asleep. And I want to make sure this is clear. They did not just fall asleep in a prayer meeting. They fell asleep in the middle of a spiritual battle. Jesus brought them to pray with him when he was at his weakest. When the battle was the hardest. The disciples, though, were sleeping. And I want you to know that we are in... A moment, a time, a season where, man, the battle is raging, right? It's the hardest. It's the most intense in some ways. Man, it feels the heaviest. But Jesus is asking us as his church, he's saying, wake up. Can you keep watch? Can you stand with me? Can you pray and stand with me for one hour or will you stay asleep? You know, sometimes it's just easier to fall asleep. Have you ever been super anxious or super fearful or maybe there's a situation that you need to deal with, but you really don't want to deal with that situation? So I don't know, maybe it's just me, but you're like, I'll just go to sleep. And we think that it will be gone when we wake up, but it's still there. And theologians say that the darkness of this moment in Gethsemane was so heavy and so difficult that it actually was easier to fall asleep and just ignore it, just do away with it, just not pay attention to it. But will we turn over? Will we ignore it? Will we sleep or will we rise up to it? Parents, let me ask you, will you stay asleep? Will you be the ones to disciple your kids or will you keep allowing culture to? So many parents are asleep. I'm not, hey, it's hard to be a parent. But that doesn't mean we can fall asleep. Young adults, will you stay asleep? Will you keep living in compromise or will you finally stand for righteousness? Husbands and wives, will you stay asleep? Will you keep allowing whatever into your home and whatever into your marriage? Or will you finally start cleaning some stuff out? Have you been in a slumber lately? Have you been missing his voice? Have you been going just through the motions? Have you lost his heart for what his heart breaks for? Have you been unexpected of what he wants to do? Have you just been showing up but not letting him do anything in your life? Can I tell you, 2024 is a good year to wake up again. 2024 is a good year to shake yourself awake again. So I I know it, it can be easy to think that you haven't fallen asleep, but can I just go a little deeper? Can I take you a little deeper this morning? Now we're going to go to Judges chapter 16. Again, if you have an Android, keep it up. We all have probably heard this story, at least in Sunday school. But it's the story of Samson and Delilah. They ended up wanting to um, attack and weaken Samson. Because if they attacked and weakened Samson, that means they attacked and weakened Israel. They attack and weaken the person that God chooses. Well, they can they can affect the whole nation. And can I tell you that if the enemy can attack the church of Jesus, he can impact the nation. Okay, they just man. Okay, so Sam, so so they're like, man, how do we get this man named Samson? Well, it wasn't really hard. It wasn't a huge army. It wasn't a secret ops plan. You know what they did, right? They got Samson to fall asleep. Man, this is powerful stuff, right? They they just got, oh, we'll just, we'll, we'll just attack him, not while he's awake, but while he's asleep. Judges 16, I'm going to try to read through it as quickly as I can. We're going 13 through 22, so follow along with me. We're going to go through it. Delilah then said to Samson, all this time you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head into fabric on the loom and tighten it with the pen, I'll become as weak as any other man. 
So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into fabric, and tightened it with the pin. <clears throat> Again, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin and the loom and the, with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your strength. With such nagging, that's so funny to me, uh, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite, dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Listen to this. And after putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Listen, Samson was able to be defeated while he was asleep. I want to remind you that this story that is a, um, even w what it's showing is that, yes, Samson was physically asleep, but it's, a physical representation of what had already been happening spiritually in Samson. So understand that. Oh, well, that's physical asleep. You know, no, no, no. It's a representation of what had all. If you go back and read Judges 13, 14, and 15, it's already a representation of what had been happening to Samson spiritually. Samson was not just physically sleeping, he had already been spiritually sleeping. And it's when we are spiritually asleep that we will stop doing the physical things. Oh, when you're spiritually asleep, guess what? You won't, oh man, that's, I'm getting ahead in my notes. But man, you'll, you, you won't worship as hard. Oh man, you won't show up as much. Oh, you'll take a little bit more days off of your word. Oh, you won't care so much about how holy or righteous your life looks like. Oh, physical things follow our spiritual attitudes and postures. It says, in 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul writes, says, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we cannot be unaware of his schemes. You see, people that are spiritually asleep are, un are either unaware or they will ignore the schemes of the enemy. They, will, they are either ignorant or they will ignore. Neither are okay. Now, see, for so long when I read this story, I'm like, Yo, Samson, how are you so dumb? Right? Like, how are you that dumb? Four times, like three times she asks you, and then like conveniently the Philistines are there. And you keep telling her things. But you want to know what I realized? I realized, and I connected these dots, that he's, he's not dumb, he's just ignoring. He's falling asleep. You see, when I'm physically asleep, my eyes are closed so I can't see anything. And it's the same thing when I'm spiritually asleep. When I'm spiritually asleep and my spiritual eyes are closed, I can't see what the enemy is doing. But many times what it means is I don't want to see what the enemy is doing. And that's what happened with Samson. It's not that he couldn't know. It's that he chose not to know. And, 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 and many times what we do is we close our spiritual eyes. We're like, man, I don't want to see it. I don't want to know. I mean, I, don't, I want to be ignorant. But the truth of the matter is that that's not okay because you're allowing the enemy to attack you. He's ignoring the obvious. He, is, he, do, he doesn't want to know. He'd rather not deal with it. And the church is like that, that we rather not deal with it. we rather just let it pass. we rather just hope that everything works out. But the truth is that's not what is going to happen. If we stay asleep, just like Samson, the th those things that we are ignoring will eventually destroy us. The 
There's so much happening. And we're saying, oh, that's not that bad. Oh, man, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to be too religious. But the word of God says, do not be ignorant of the enemy's schemes. Do not ignore what the enemy is doing. Do not be caught sleeping. I used to be a Christian that was like, man, I love Jesus, and it's not really my role to say that or to speak into that or to, or, or, or to stand for that. But no, you know what that was? Spiritual sleepiness. It is time for the church. It's time for you as a Christian. It is time for you to stop turning a blind eye. It is time for Christians to vote. It's time for us to stand up. It's time for Christians to pray and fast. It's time for Christians to show up consistently. It's time for Christians to start tithing. It's time for Christians to read and declare scriptures of God's word. It's time for Christians to care about where and who your money is going to. It's time for Christians to say, you know what, I'm going to be a little louder. Man, guess what? What I do in the physical, God will start to do in the spiritual. That what I do in the natural, God will work and make and, and cause to be supernatural. I'm not saying be a, become a keyboard warrior, okay? Listen to that. Where you're just on Facebook and you're just da, 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 da. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is time for you to not just take up space in a seat. Because guess what? And I'm about to go to it in my sermon. You can be in the right spot but still be spiritually asleep. Oh, you can be in the room, but be sleeping. You want to know how I know? Because it happened to a boy named Eutychus. Oh, a boy named Eutychus. Let me read it to you. Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. It says, on the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. The upstairs room where we met was lit with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Now, this is a crazy story. Okay, now Eutychus is the only person ever that gets put in the Bible for falling asleep in church. This is crazy. But here you have Eutychus who's in church, he's doing spiritual things. Listen, oh please listen to me. He's doing spiritual things, but he's still falling asleep. He's in the church service, but he's still asleep. Man, he's singing the worship song, but he's still asleep. He has his Bible in his hand, but he's still asleep. He might even have his tithe on auto draft, but his is still asleep. Come on, I'm coming. Man, I went for the people that are ignorant to the enemy schemes, but now I'm coming for the people that, man, you're just, you're, you're still asleep even though you're going through the motions. Eutychus was at the place but he wasn't present. Another way to say it is this. He had good intention, but he wasn't paying attention. Maybe the thing that is killing Christianity in America, maybe the thing that is killing your spiritual life is not your intention, but it's your lack of, of attention. Man, maybe it's our lack of focus. Maybe it's our lack of discipline. Maybe it's our lack of commitment. Man, we have Christians that come to church, but they haven't given up sin yet. We have Christians that know Jesus, but they haven't led anybody else to him. We have Christians that sing worship songs, but still holding a grudge in their hearts. We, we have Christians that hate where the world is at, but they're not praying for the world. 
Oh man, we're, we have Christians that are in the room, but they have fallen asleep. And I think if the enemy can't take you out with sin, he'll take you out by putting you to sleep. Amen. My, I'll ask the question that I've been asking the whole time. Have you fallen asleep? Have you fallen asleep? Maybe you've been in this game 40, 50 years. Have you fallen asleep? Maybe you're a new believer and you, ha- you were on fire six months ago, but have you already fallen asleep? Worship team, you can come. Have you dozed off a little in your passion? Maybe in your convictions. Maybe in your attention and focus. Have you dozed off a little bit in your boldness? Have you dozed off? Are you just going through the motions? Here's, here's how I know. Here are some signs of you falling spiritually asleep. I'm going to go through them quick. You follow the crowd and you blend in. Instead of speaking out on things of God. You complain more than you pray. Man, you're complaining. You complain to man instead of pray to God. Oh, that's a sign of spiritual sleepiness. Here's another one. You get easily offended. Everything bothers you. You intake more entertainment than Bible and prayer. You want to be served instead of serving. Here's another one. You isolate yourself from community. That means you're falling asleep. Oh, I just, man, whatever, I'm on my own. Here's another sign. Church is a chore, not a privilege. I get sometimes we got to be disciplined and we just got to make it happen. But if it's always a chore, you might be falling asleep. Here's another one. You're avoiding accountability. You don't want people to check you. You don't want people to speak into your life. Whatever. You're avoiding accountability. Here's another one. You have an entitled attitude that I'm owed this. No, no, no. You're not owed anything. We're all owed hell. You're not owed anything. You have an entitled attitude. You have no desire to pray anymore. And you're no longer convicted of your sin. And it's gotten, it's gotten worse. I've been praying. I've been praying for today. That he begins and has and does wake you up from your slumber. That I can be somebody that comes in, and trust me, I need this all the time. And every, man, I, I, every time I preach this message, it, it does something in me even. That, that I've been praying that, guess what? That I can be someone that says, wake up. Because the enemy is attacking, and God needs his church to be advancing. So it's time in this season, in this moment, it's time. Guess what? It's time to wake up. We can't afford for you to be asleep anymore. Guess what? Your family can't afford for you to be asleep anymore, Dad. Oh, man. Guess what? Uh, Your workplace can't, can't afford for you to be asleep anymore. Your home can't afford for you to be asleep anymore. Your marriage can't, be, can't afford for you to be asleep anymore. And I'm here today to tell you it's time to wake up. Oh, awake up, oh sleeper. Awake and arise from your slumber. Oh, it's no longer you're going to be asleep. You are not blind any longer anymore. It is time for you to open up your spiritual eyes and say, you know what? I'm coming against the kingdom of darkness, and I'm going to advance the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus.
It's time for people to wake up and say, no, Satan, you can't have my family. You can't have my kids. You can't have my marriage. Oh, man, it's time for the church to arise and wake up and say, guess what? I'm not just going to take up space, but guess what? I'm going to be led by his spirit. I'm not just going to try to fill a room. I'm going to try to fill heaven. I'm no longer going to be okay with just showing up, but I want to be used by God. Awake, O oh sleeper. From your slumber. Stand with me today. Man, I don't want just stuff. I want God's heart. I don't want to let evil do what it wants. I want to stand for righteousness. I don't want to ignore. I want to help change. I don't want to be asleep in this hour. I want to be used by God. I must be awake. So which one are you? Everybody bow your heads, close your eyes, just so that you can focus on what I'm saying and there's no distractions. Have you fallen asleep? Which one are you? Have you fallen asleep and you've become unaware or you've started to ignore the schemes of the enemy? Is that you? Or maybe you've just fallen asleep to the things of God. You've been showing up, but man, you haven't been present. Your intention might be right, but your attention hasn't been. I don't really care which one you are. It doesn't matter. All I care about is that you wake up. Woo, that you wake up. This isn't a condemnation thing. It's not a guilt thing. We all need it. And it doesn't matter where you are in your spiritual journey. You could be in it 50 years and be asleep. You could be in it six months and be asleep. But God wants to wake you up today. And sometimes the best thing we can do to wake ourselves up is physically respond. Is physically respond. So I want to ask you to, on the count of three, to lift up your hand. If this is you, you say, man, I need, okay, I gotta gotta wake up. I gotta shake myself up. Come on, man, yeah, hands are already going up.